Welcome back to Following Noanon, a Stormlight podcast. This week, we are covering the Dragon Seal 2023 pre release chapter of Stormlight 5. And it is my genuine privilege to welcome to the podcast the mastermind of the best Stormlight essay channel out there, fancy aficionado, host of Lost in Roshar, the one and only. Christian Krembling, thank you for being a guest today. How are you? <laughs> oh, I really appreciate you using the uh, formal title of Christian Krembling. It means <laughs> of a lot. Of course. <laughs> um, much too kind of an intro. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Um, it's my genuine privilege as well, because in my mind, you guys are the original Stormlight podcast. Uh, and uh, it feels kind of bizarre to be here, but I'm really excited. Um, a little nervous because I'm usually hiding behind uh, my audio only setup, um, but that's okay. And uh, look, it's finally great to talk about some uh, book five stuff because my co-host on my podcast, Jimmy, has not um, not um, checked it out yet. So I've been dying to talk about this for a while. Welcome in. Paul, how are you? Wonderful. You know, I was mentioning earlier, it's been a long time since we've had a guest, and to have Christian here is super awesome. We're really excited about that. And, I mean, reading this chapter really just blew open a lot of doors in my mind, and so I can't wait to to dive in and, and just talk all through through book five. Elliot? I am doing excellent. I'm so excited for Stormlight 5. It... De December is going to be here before we know it. And reading this kind of stuff just gets me super pumped for that. Although it also reminds me of how much content I need to brush up on before we get to then. So a lot, a lot of stuff for us to cover and a lot of things for me to brush up on so that we can fully soak in the craziness that's going to be wind and truth. It's true. We have two big name drops, not necessarily for people who scour the copper mine for years but for paul and elliot we have quite the two name drops in this pre-release chapter and you guys might be quickly realizing why we've read things in the order that we have read things because the uh i'll go ahead and say it galanon and demu two characters that we have read quite recently on the podcast we've just finished Elantris lately, and we've just finished Mistborn Era 1 lately. So here we are very quickly getting re getting a reunion with Demu. So let's roll intro, and then Elliot, if you wouldn't mind summarizing it very briefly on what happened in this chapter. All right, Elliot, when you're ready. Okie doke. This chapter isn't super long and not a whole lot happens in it, but man, the things that do happen are kind of crazy. We pick up, we open the scene in Erie where we're just in like a shop with a, a little girl who who's in the shop with her, her mom. But we quickly pick up on that. This is the granddaughter. I think it was of, that one shoemaker guy we saw in an interlude, I don't even remember which book it was in. Was it Words of Radiance, Wave Kings? One of those? I believe it was Words either, of Radiance. It was either Words of Radiance or Oathbringer. I was thinking about that. Mm -hmm. So my money's on Oathbringer, pick up a, I think. I yeah. Think. Oathbringer? We know who Nail is. That was my distinction in my head. Or we yeah. get yes. a glimpse from anyways. Yes. So we pick up with her. She's got she, she's peeking out of her shop. There's apparently singers walking by in the in the street. She has a different name for them. I was going to ask you guys about that. And then she's got some strangers in her in her shop, and they're just asking around for for information. And then it's not too long before they start name dropping, like like you said, Trevor. And we learn that it is Demu and Galadon and some other dude I don't recognize the name of. Although I'm curious if maybe I if maybe I should. 
and they're just chatting. They're trying to get information out of the little girl and then she kind of freaks out and runs back to the back of the shop. They kind of pursue her to get maybe some more information out of her. And then her mom comes back, whips out a shard blade and has a little mini showdown with Galadon and Demu in the, the back of the shop here. And then it doesn't take long before they're kind of ushered out. Things start to kind of go crazy. It's a little ominous and a little vague on what exactly is happening, but that giant spren that's in the in the bay with the difficult name to pronounce, Kusikesh or something like that. Close enough. We should yeah. have done a spell check. <laughs> yeah, we should have. I think we did a spell check on that back in the day. Comes, we probably did. Comes out of did. comes out of the water, opens a perpendicularity, and people start heading through it. And so they're like, all right, pack up our things, guys. We're never coming back to Roshar. Close chapter. <laughs> As you do. Yeah. 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 Right. So, yeah. I don't know where you want to start with that, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as as usual, I usually want to start with the most exciting part, but I, I will hold back because I really want to know why they're never coming back to Roshar, but I'm, I'm going to hold off on that. Demu and Galadon are wandering around Roshar. We, we get the reveal or the confirmation that... It is Demu, Galadon, and Bayon, I believe is his name, who are our three strangers way back in our first interlude of the Stormlight Archive with Ishik in the Pure Lake. Paul. So good. Ishik is being referenced once again on the podcast. Do you have any thoughts and feelings about <laughs> our beloved Ishik? All I have to say is finally, finally, I mean, I, I'm I, I know I've mentioned this already. I'm currently rereading The Way of Kings. I, I'm I'm into like I'm almost done with part two, I think. And I read those first interludes with Ishik and I was listening so intently the whole time, like, okay, there's gotta be there's gotta be something. There's gotta be something. And still it felt like there was absolutely not not much I could take with it. So um I think that's hilarious. Here we are full circle christian i have a question for you you might know the answer to this sure i knew that it was galadon demu and bayon because of the copper mind how is that revealed to us is that just people asking brandon do you know how we knew that um i don't know if maybe brandon was like the person who had to say yes you're correct but i feel like um in the way of king's interlude where they first show up i remember it's one of the way the characters speak there's like a slang that they use which kind of says that they're from a certain place and i okay. think that was to do with elantris um i'm not as i haven't finished elantris so i don't know and the rest was just you know cheeky descriptions of how they kind of looked i mean demu i feel like was a real wild card to guess a few books back but somehow people did that I can barely remember him at all. Like, I kind of want you guys to refresh me. No, no, no. I was going to say, oh, wait, hold on. Hold <laughs> Elliot, on. Never... Elliot's been waiting <laughs> for my reaction here. So when we covered Miss Warner 1, I made the claim <laughs> that Demu is my favorite character in Miss Warner 1. And <laughs> okay. both, my, both my podcast co-hosts look at me with, but why though? Because he has like, six scenes where he talks and all of them are pretty in in inconsequential. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then it's revealed that he's on Roshar looking for Hoyd with Galadon. I wonder with the slang that you're talking about, Christian, I wonder in the Ishik chapter, does Galadon ever meant drop the line Suli? Because that's um, his, that's his term in Elantris is Colin. I, uh, right. Yeah, I think it's it was like a stand-in word for that because okay. there's like some translating going on. So people like, oh, who adds in a word at the end of a sentence? But I could be way off base here. But that's vaguely the story I remember telling myself of how people figured it out. Okay, yeah. okay. So y'all knew that that those were the people, like, in the interlude before now. 
Yeah. Because that I don't yes. I don't know how you'd pick them out. I'm like, this is the reveal where people know that. That impresses me. I, I don't know. It, With Galadon, it does make more sense in my head. Demu, I was gonna bring up Trevor. I'm like, did you whisper in Brandon's ear to <laughs> to slide Demu in here? Because I'm like, still he's your favorite. That's wonderful. That's 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 brilliant. But I don't I don't get it. I, he's he's cool. I mean he's cool, don't get me wrong, but it's still very minor in my head. So you know. So the the only reason I knew it was Demu was again I looked it up, but when I looked it up, I didn't really have strong connections to Demu. I'd read Miss Mornero one once and I didn't really care about Galanon or Demu. Um because when I read the Cosmere my first time through, all I wanted to know was, okay, how does this relate to Stormlight? All I care about is Stormlight. Give me any secrets I can use reading Rhythm of War. That's all I want to know. And so I didn't really care about the stories as they were, <laughs> as I was learning them. But going back, I had a much greater appreciation for Demu because he's just a poor soldier trying to keep his head down stay true to his faith, do his, stay in his lane, do his own thing. And I, I don't know, have a soft spot for Demu. And to, to see him on Roshar, to know I might see cameos of him moving on in the future of the Cosmere. Because, what, in this chapter, it would imply that all three of them knew the perpendicularity was about to open up, right? Elliot, did you catch that? I, I kind of did. And I was gonna, I was gonna ask you guys about that. I, I was having a hard time keeping it straight which of the three is talking because it doesn't actually introduce their names until like halfway through. So you have to read the whole thing and then you have to go back to the start and then try and attach the names to the, to the descriptions. But I think it's Galadon, is the one who keeps saying like, "We, we got to be on time." I'm not sure. And then his, at the end like an an alarm goes off, like his phone dings. (laughs) There's like a, it it says there's a, there's a a bell sound and he's like, Oh, it's time. And, and they're talking about this device that is always unpredictable. It's in like the the third or fourth paragraph. Do we've got like, they have like a countdown. They have like a stopwatch going. They know what's going to happen. Maybe, maybe it's a pager that's tied to the perpendicularity. So they get a little beep. To go check, you know. Do you have any yeah, thoughts I... on future Cosmere technology there, Christian? Well, I mean, we straight up see a gun, which was kind of fun. Yes. Later yes. in the chapter. Um, but in terms of the timer, I feel kind of bad because as you said that, I was like, oh, really? And then it's right at the beginning of the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> because I listened to it when he first read it or whenever it got published. And I kind of read it quickly to prepare for today and i've missed that bit but i'm assuming like these three know all of the perpendicularities on rosha considering they're chasing hoid um so i'm assuming there's one at the pure lake and am i are you guys of the same opinion like i'm not sure what to make of this is kusikesh always been a perpendicularity he's just like kind of hard to use or is it just today that he's decided to do this well and 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 let's back up a second as far as i know as far as i feel like we've seen so far perpendicularities seem to be attached to shards or bondsmith i guess we've seen it we've seen our bondsmith create a perpendicularity Mm -hmm. so to have this kind of random but i guess really powerful spren all of a sudden creating one like that's kind of a new category of of perpendicularity for me i think maybe yeah yeah i agree i don't think we've seen that any thoughts paul before i have a theory (laughs) nothing nothing formative i mean this is just like a big big question for me i don't know if this is an awakening my question and i don't know if we actually know this is do we have any context to roughly where this is in the book I assume there's no context. Brandon Sanderson just said, here's another chapter. Because I'm like, I feel like this could would be, I would think of this very differently if this is 
part three and onward, or if this is like a closer to the beginning or what. So I here's really all the don't have much. Here's all the insight I have for you. Before Rhythm of War came out, we had a Sylphrena interlude released to us early before in the prep for Rhythm of War. That interlude was in the first set of interludes between part one and part two. So I would assume that's where this interlude falls in, between part one and part two. That's a big assumption, though. It, it very well could be post-Contest of Champions, pre like during the Contest of Champions, the Contest of Champions starts, and then Kusakesh comes out of Shadesmar and says, time to go. Hmm. If you it definitely this, feels really close to that moment. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's a panic. That's, it's like evacuation, you know? Absolutely. That's my thought. Is I'm like, like the two options is, oh, this is kind of an odd happenstance, or this is like either honor is back, or someone, a lot of people are dead, or something, or the world is literally ending. It has to be something bigger, I feel like, and we're kind of seeing like interlude kind of across the world or whatever this going on. So I have a grander theory concerning the ear the Eriali. Kusikesh declares, like in his booming voice or whatever, it is time for the fifth migration or the, the fifth journey. And so now I'm wondering, and what is the what is the name of the girl that we're in the point of view of? D- Dila? No. D- Diel? Diel? Yeah. Diel? Yeah. She assumes or makes the quick assumption that it's honors perpendicularity. Honors perpendicularity has opened, or she makes some reference to honor, which is a big deal, by the way. I don't think, like, we know where honors perpendicular perpendicularity is besides in the hands of Dalinar. Mm-hmm. So now I'm wondering, okay, who gave Kusikesh the assignment to evacuate the Iriali? Was it honor himself while he was still alive or was it Dalinar right? Like just before this, or do you guys have any thoughts there? How, how does Kusikesh open honors perpendicular perpendicularity like like we said earlier? Who gave him that permission? Okay, so I, I, I'm 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 looking at this part of the chapter right now, actually, and the quote that Kusikesh says, he says, "People, it is here. I am to be your guide for the fifth journey." The way he says, "I am to be your guide," makes me think that it's an assignment. It it, yeah. it feels to me like it is like. An assignment, I guess we could say, I mean, you could, there's multiple ways we could predict this, but I would guess it was an assignment given to Kusakesh before Honor died, maybe. And and that's just why he's kind of been slumbering to the best of my memory. He's just been hanging out. I'm, I'm really not sure. That's a mystery, but it makes me feel like he was definitely assigned this in some way, just the verbiage of it. Uh, but it really, you. that's that may just be grasping at straws. That's probably <laughs> trying too hard. I don't know. I agree. I agree. Like it feels like an assignment. It also, <laughs> just in the tone I read it, it was like, was he the first choice? It sounded yeah. like <laughs> sort of tap on the shoulder, like, yeah. oh, guys, I got to be your guide. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. let's go. That's funny. But what's curious to me, like, because I recently, not long ago, read it the interlude where Kuzikesh shows up in the way of Kings and people go out every day to see him um, show up and do his thing and look towards the origin, which is another big question of the series. Um, So do they like, they were waiting for him to do this eventually, but it feels like the tourists don't understand what this sprint is for. So maybe only the Iriali are aware. Um, that he's a perpendicularity, or that, or maybe not. He's a perpendicularity that he's just significant to their religion, their journey. That that's a neat point that you make. I think my biggest, 
I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is something I was supposed to remember from the previous books, but you know, when this happens, the the character we're following here is it Dial? I think that's the name. Hmm. Dial is like, you know, she's she's a bit frazzled, but but she's like, okay, uh, let's go get our bags and go. I guess like, hmm. like they 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 know this is supposed to happen. They know this is a thing. It feels reminiscent of kind of the like. Uh, what's the word? Like prophecy type of thing, like a pr- prophecy, I guess, religious prophecy, like maybe you see in Mistborn or or other things. I'm I'm not sure. So, yeah, but they seem they seem like they knew that this was supposed to happen, or they knew this was coming, and like, okay, today's the day, and grab our bags, let's let's hop on board with Kusakesh. Leave and never come back, you know, just a Tuesday. I don't know. <laughs> it, it felt like they knew what was going on. And I'm like, was that something that I, I don't think that's, I don't remember that ever being mentioned before that the Iriali had anything with this or knew anything about this coming. I was kind of mm-hmm. sideswiped by that. Have you guys, how are you guys on words of Brandon? Like, do you check out, is that considered spoilers or? But the way we approach it on this podcast is mm-hmm. Paul and Elliot, it's not that they like deliberately avoid them. They just don't really have the time to devour them. So anything that I provide them, we discuss. But okay. anything that I haven't read or don't pay attention to, we don't bring up. But feel free to bring up anything that you like, assuming there's not like trust or Miss Monero 2 spoilers in them. No, no, I was just, because I was reading up on the Iriali this morning and through, like, sneaking clues in the books, but mainly words of Brandon, there's a bit of clarification about, like, these journeys and what they're up to. Have you looked into that as well, Trevor? A little bit, but enlighten us, if you would. Okay, cool. I'm just making sure it's a a safe space to share this. Yeah, of course. Um, Yeah, so basically they didn't, through, through Brandon's words, apparently the Iri- Iriali did not come from Ashen like the rest of the humans on Rosha. They've come from somewhere else. And every so often they uh, go on another journey, so to speak, and they show up on another planet in the Cosmere. So this feels like, all right, we're off to the next series. Um, yeah. We've done our time on Rosha. We'll hop over to a new book. We'll see you in Mistborn Era 3 or something. Yeah, that's what yeah. I felt like. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I was like in my head going through everything I've read in a post Stormlight timeline within the Cosmere thinking, did I see any like blonde haired people? Um, but that's so vague. There's nothing much else to distinguish the Iriali. Um but there probably is more because they didn't come from the same place as everyone else. We just don't know what those things are yet. It almost makes me wonder if Kusakesh the Spren like travels with them and he's mm. their their gateway that they, they travel with. And so they always have that option to hop back into the cognitive realm and, and travel with that being maybe a Maybe confusing part of that would be we haven't really seen Spren exactly shown the way they are in Roshar elsewhere. There's other kinds of beings. So, like, does he try? Is he a Spren that goes elsewhere or is it something different? I don't know. Well, after what you just said, now I'm beginning to question of whether he actually is a Spren. Oh, or yeah. If that's just Roshar's term for it. Oh, yeah, that's a Spren. Yeah. Or yeah, if you think you're onto it. Yeah. If he could just be like, you know, this Shadesmar creature dude who walks around with the Eerie or the <laughs> Eeriali, and he sh- shows up on Roshar and they're like, yep, that's a big, weird looking Spren, but it's a Spren. So I wonder yeah. if they miscategorized him. It would definitely make sense with just what we know about Spren. He, this was always the question of like, what the heck is this thing doing here? This right Usakesh guy doesn't really fit the the mold that you learn as you go through the books uh one other thing i wanted to mention if if we have more on this than 
by all means go right ahead. But one thing I just noticed as I was looking at the chapter as well, um, the the way it's phrased from th this could this could be I mean this could be dicey of how it's written in the verbiage here, um, but th but the the phrasing is you know it says in quotes people, Kusakesh spoke, and then it says that sp that spren never spoke. Period. That makes me think this is also digging in that our mm. point of view here with Dial, this character, this Iriali characters she also uh, d does she have a spread that talks to her is she bonded but just doesn't know anything of what that means or maybe i'm just digging way into that she mentions that her mom glows but she doesn't really know what the whole like <laughs> radiant thing is and so i'm like you know, the phrasing of that makes me think that uh, there are other spread that that spoke that speak Makes me wonder mm. if there's a there's a bond there behind the scenes that we don't know about. I believe that's a m potentially pretty minor detail that that's not very relevant, but just something I noticed. I think what you said um, is kind of a good counterpoint to Trevor's argument that it's not a spren, because Dial's an Iriali and she's calling it a spren. So if if anyone's not going to call it a spren, it's them, right? I guess that's um, true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I was following you because what I was going to say is when we first see him, he's like scrolling through all these different faces when he's, when he looks oh, out of the yeah. water. So I'm like, uh, does he have like a different face for the different lands that Man, he shows up on or something? I should have reread that chapter. I, I have not read that chapter in years. Yeah. It's really weird. I mean, it's an Axis chapter. So of course it's weird. Yeah. But the description is just, so odd and like you said not really like any sort of spren that we've seen like it doesn't fit any spren category besides just being weird um so i like the thought that it's from maybe from wherever these guys originate and he just follows them and he like gets them yeah. a ticket out of there yeah my, my other question related to this i feel like we briefly talked about this but but to 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 point on it specifically of the way it says it, it sounds like this is tied to honor. It implies mm -hmm. that it's tied to honor, honor's perpendicularity or something. We know honor to have been tied to the storm father. So I don't have a great question with this other than what, like, like who, what <laughs> is Kusakesh actually tied to honor in some way, shape or form. Did honor just, ask Kusakesh as a friend, like, hey, buddy, can you, like, do this, you know, f for me in a, in a little while, you know? Or is he actually tied to honor? I, I don't I don't know. Oh. No. Okay. I'll, I'll articulate it so everyone else can also say no. But <laughs> okay. I, I was going to say, so what if... What if on... I know this is incorrect, but what if what if Honor was the original guide of the Iriali, shows up on Roshar, realize uh, for their fourth journey or whatever is Roshar, realizes he's going to die from odium, and then assigns Kusakesh as their next guide. So Kusakesh is like, I guess I'm assigned to be your guide in place of Honor. Now I know that's not true because Honor has always been on Roshar, but you could then substitute it with somebody else. There was some other perpendicularity equipped guide for the Iriali. And, but now it's Kusikesh with honors perpendicularity, because that's, what's really sticking with me because if it really is honors perpendicularity that's being used here, how did the Iriali use it beforehand? Because honor is tied to Roshar and that's been, for a super long time, right? So have they always used honors perpendicularity or not? I mean, isn't it like you just have to go in and out of shades more through a perpendicularity? I don't know all yes. the hard rules on that. So I'm like, is this just where they came out? Whenever they came over from whatever planet they were on before? Of right honors on. perpendicularity, maybe maybe originally before honor died. I don't know. That That seems gray area to me. So as you guys were talking about that, the Iriali being 
of somewhere else, this being the the call to leave and go on the journey, move on to the next planet. I remembered something just now. Isn't Adolin's mother Iriali? <laughs> that could, that could oh be my huge. goodness. <laughs> so you're immediately you're immediately jumping to where I, I just did in, in my brain. Is Adolin gonna get some kind of a call to go with these people? Is this a and is this a bloodline thing? Is this gonna be like a Spren appears to Adolin and says, Hey man, time to go. All all your people are, are leaving. Is that gonna happen? That's crazy. You're you're right. I just correct. looked it up. That's crazy. Wow. Oh man, this copper mine page just got very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> She's a devout follower of the eerie religion and believes in the one. Whoa. Uh huh. He's got the hair, right? He's he's got a little bit uh -huh. of the of the blonde. Yeah, I know he has the hair. blonde blonde mixed hair. And and by extension, right, Renarin as well. Although I'm not. I'm not sure if he's described like the same way visually, but he's got the same same heritage, same parentage. Yeah. I I believe it's described as Adolin has like blonde with specks of black, and Renarin is vice versa. He has he's mostly like black hair with like mm. blonde tips or or blonde patches. So interesting. That's so good that you picked that up because if nobody did. Every comment would be like, "What about Adolin's mom?" <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Wow, that's really interesting. I want because it's like she's mixed with Alethi, isn't? As far as I'm seeing here, I think I don't think she's fully. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh no, 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 she's not. It just says she's almost as tall as an Alethi. Um. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. I'll have to go off and. Uh, look into that christian's cool. gonna go make a video on that yeah, one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do it. i will give credit don't worry that was a great find that's awesome yeah. my nice. my other question to kind of carry us to our next next topic we, we've danced around this a, a little bit and touched on it a, a tiny bit but what, what what do you guys think are the the other events happening on roshar at the same time why why now why is Kusakesh opening up the perpendicular to take them all? Why do Galadon and Demu know it's going to happen? Apparently, is is this aligning with other monumental events? Is this escaping some kind of desolation? I use that word, you know, kind of intentionally. Uh, this feels. I'm going to give our token um, Tolkien reference for the episode. Have uh, this feels. Like, yeah. This feels like uh, the elves just leaving Middle Earth, <laughs> kind of thing, you know. Maybe. I'm like, our personally, I think this is this is going on either an indicator beforehand or right after. Like, I would say maybe the contest of champions is going south, and the world is as Ro Roshar as we know it is supposed to end. I don't know if it will necessarily like end, but. At least the Iriali are like, okay, yep, yeah, time to pack up our bags. It's over, onto the next planet before this one goes out the door. I think, I think that's where this is. I could be very wrong, but I think this is tied to the contest of champions. I think this is what's going on alongside of that. Hey everyone, Trevor, editing episode. We had some technical issues at us right about there. We don't actually continue with Paul's thought. We solve our technical issues and. Pick up again with another thought here. Who's the lady who leaves the letter with the mom? Do we know? The, I've got a clue. Maybe. Maybe, potentially. Um, the only... I mean, we saw the rings like Elliot was showing. So I'm guessing ferrochemist immediately. And the only uh, ferrochemist of note on Rosha that I know of is Axindweth. Do you know? Guy, do you guys know about her? Yes. So I was just like, that's the only one I know. So I'm assuming it could be her. Although v vague memories, isn't Axindweth in the Sons of Honor trying to bring back the Voidbringers? Doesn't she give Eshenai the Voidspren? 
Yeah, she's part of all that. And she's like, from what I gather, she's working closely with Gavala. Right. Like, very closely with Gavala. Um, we can talk about the prologue, right, of Wind and Truth? Sure. Yep. Yeah, there was a line in there that really stuck out to me uh, where, like, Gavala's thinking about the good old days. And he's like, oh, yeah, we had the best times. Me, Sadius, Sadius's wife, who I'm forgetting, and good old Axend Weth. I'm like, excuse me? Oh, no, no, sorry. Not, it wasn't Axend Weth. It was, um, it was um, Elokar's wife, Asudan. I'm like, interesting that she oh, got a yeah. name drop in the, in the inner circle. Um, huh. But no, he, he does think about Axend Weth, but he thinks she's a bit of a chaotic element. He's like, I got to watch out for her so i th feel like she's got some double agent tendencies um she might not be working for anyone that we know might be for a different cause okay yeah i i wrote down x and width with a question mark in my notes when i read it because i i thought of her but then it it didn't seem to fit anymore because the letter was delivered by the woman with a lot of rings but then the letter is actually from. How do they how do they reference him? They reference him as the trickster. Oh. Yeah, I, I oh, noted he, this. Yeah, uh, he was the trickster aspect <laughs> spun yeah. out of the one to create chaos. Is the quote that they they have? And it it it's not too far to stretch to immediately jump to that must be Hoyd because our mm. three hunter folks we're looking for Hoyd last time we saw them. And clearly this is probably a reference to Hoyd. So, so the letters from Hoyd, but would he really be using X and with to deliver it? Confusing. Mm. Yeah. That, that's a good reason to be like, it's probably not her. Um, but at the same time, I kind of like the idea of her working for a, a few different important people. Um, Ooh, this is yeah. the, the theme of me never letting go of my theory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will hold on for dear life and make this I work. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just think, okay, like in the case that it's not accent worth, it just feels like another person to introduce. Mm. Um, and it just might, that's, that's my only counter argument. That's all I've got. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I feel, I don't know how accent worth would get connected with Hoyd. It could be through other people. I don't really know. It it wouldn't seem too far off to me, but it would seem strange to have another vaguely similar character with the amount of relevance that Extend With has in our story. Like that seems odd. So logically, I feel like I could meta game it and say logically, it'd feel weird for us to not be Extend With. Oh, Paul makes a great point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's making yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> I I have a hard time figuring out whose side the letter delivery lady would be on because mm. Hoy gives gives her the letter to give to the shop lady who's the radiant, right? Because he mm. knows that Demu, Galadon, and Bayon will go to Erie to leave. Presumably, right? Or, Are these okay or, assumptions? Or, or just Maybe that not. he knows if he drops it here, it'll eventually get to them. That eventually they're going to swing by this area and and pick it up, perhaps. Because, like, this, yeah, I don't know if it's because they're going to leave, or because he knows what they're interested in, which seems to be, uh, I don't know why that's <laughs> the bullets. Is it your birthday? Guys. No, it's just oh, MacBooks have these things where you make hand signals and uh, that happens. I thought I had that switched off, but that's on the internet now forever. Great. Happy birthday, Christian. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, the thing is, right, they, they're, they're kind of like scholars. They are, they are following Hoyd, but they are scholars of magic it seems like because they want to study spren and in, i felt like in the first one yes they're looking for hoid but they're also looking at the magic fish of the pure yeah. lake that yeah. seemed to be of great interest so but then why would they specifically want to study a spren 
at this cobbler's family's house. It, that feels a little loose. So maybe oh. it is because they're leaving. What rating? What order is she? She has a prism esque spread. I don't. Uh, I was thinking Truth Watcher, but I could be wrong. I, I, I was getting kind of the like little glitter of prism light, which I think is what's used to describe the Truth Watcher. I believe that's the Truth Watcher spread. I think you might be right. Is that Renarin's spread? That sounds right. Well, yeah. Renarin's spread will, is a whole nother episode, but <laughs> the the Truth Watcher spread in general, I do. I, I think you might be. So, somebody will correct us, I'm sure. But yeah, I'm not sure. I did hop on the Reddit thread for this chapter, and there was talk of will shapers, but I don't know why. Um, okay. I don't know why that is the case. I'm not really okay. sure what order she is. is. And she's second ideal at least, right? Because she's got her yeah. sword. Hmm. And she seems to know that if she leaves, she can't take her spren with her. Because yeah, she's that was emotional. Oddly emotional at the end. Well, mm. not oddly for her, but oddly for the reader. Like this was a pretty light-hearted interlude, and then at the end of the episode or at the end of the chapter, you're like, "Oh, she's going to try to take this spread with her through <laughs> the perpendicularity, and she knows it's not going to work." That's that's really sad. Yeah, I wonder what happens though. Like, what is actually what happens to a spread? Do you just just like hit a barrier? Does it break the bond? There's all these questions that we don't really know the answer so to. So with with this one specifically, I'm very confident that Galadon has the answer for her. Because Galadon is from Elantris, and they have all their connection manipulation stuff, gadgets. Mm. So I'm sure he's got something in his tool belt to be like, no, just pour this on your spren, severs the connection to Roshar, she'll, she'll be fine. Um. But yes, that is a general that that is curious because I mean, obviously Spren can go to Shadesmar, but how far away from the land of Roshar can they get to? Like it Kelsier style, if you just start walking in one of the in a direction away from Roshar, how far can a Spren go? I don't know. Yeah, and I wonder if she's even seen her Spren in that form. Yeah, which was that's another thing. Do you think a question for you guys? Do you think this this interlude will get a another interlude continuing this scene, or do you reckon it's a one off? My gut would be that it's a one off that will then tie into the main storyline. It's okay. like maybe we're going to get this a little out of context early in the book, and then you know, part four, we catch up to the main story events that are driving all this. And then we start seeing like our main characters go off world or something crazy like that. Like this is going to foreshadow main character events later. That's my theory. Hmm. I, I agree that this is a one-off. I, I think this is a one-off interlude. I'm, I'm a bit torn. I think this, I kind of think it is also tied to our main story, but if it's not, if it's not super directly tied, then I think it is tied into just Cosmere connections of Trevor. I think throughout like Mistborn Era Three or something like in Mistborn Era Three, like how are the Iriali here? And this is how we know that, like way in the future kind of thing. I feel like that's the only things that it could be in my head, but I do, I do think it's a one-off. I feel like it's. I'm left with questions, but. <laughs> At least in Sanderson terms, right now I feel like it's kind of tied up in a bow. It's fairly resolved, um, even though I'm left with several questions. You know. Also, I want to say because I feel really dumb. I totally earlier was like, "Oh yeah, maybe she has a sprint because of this one word here," and she's talking to a sprint <laughs> this whole time. I totally blanked <laughs> on that entire detail. I feel incredibly dumb, so I'd like to get ahead of any allegations. <laughs> intelligence but I'd but say, don't I'm, I'm just admitting defeat here <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> but don't go down and correct your comment now from earlier leave your comment of accusing paul so that we can keep them <laughs> yeah. as for, for reference later so <laughs> it's like wow great prediction paul you really dug deep on that one <laughs> it's literally right above the the, the same sentence 
Yeah, I've got a feeling there's a perpendicularity in this chapter, guys. Yeah. Uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's choking on his wild, water. wild prediction. Yeah. So <laughs> Galadon shows up. What? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. To, to, to answer the prediction question, Dial and her mom are gone. We won't see them again. This is a one-off for Stormlight. Mm. We won't even see them in the back half. However, they'll show up in Elantris 2 or okay. Mistborn 3 or, you know, sometime Sunlit Man 2. or some, some Somewhere they'll make an appearance where there's a Night Radiant where they shouldn't be. And this will be, this will be them. Mm. I want to just quickly tie back. Sorry to what we talk, spoke about earlier with like, is Kusikesh chilling on Rosha, or is like, what's his deal, right? Um, there's all these portals coming up at the end. Like, it's not just one. There's a bunch apparently going up everywhere in the region. And when he says, "I'm your guide," it kind of feels like he's leading the charge. I mean, maybe you guys also thought this initially, but I'm only coming to this realization now that it feels like he's going as well at the at the, the way that's written there. Because Demu also says this is odd behavior for a perpendicularity of this nature. Yeah, I did catch that yeah. one. So I guess he's off. Maybe we'll see Kusikesh in Elantris too as well. Maybe. Who knows? Any other general discussion for the chapter specifically before we get to the second part of this episode gentlemen just one last oh. comment to point out the the level of technology that we see a couple of drops through this is this is weird to see for me on on roshar with what i've, I've seen yet we we've just started mistborn era two so i'm, I'm just right now starting to get exposed to you know like guns in in the cosmere but to see what I think is a gun mentioned in the hand of, I want to say, Demu, I think, at one point through this. And then I think we briefly mentioned that galadon has got some kind of device like in his pocket that's like warning him or timing him. They make a reference to a translator as if that's a device. They're like, oh, yeah, you kind of freaked people out earlier when your translator wasn't working, <laughs> you know. <laughs> What th this is this well, is new level of tech on Roshar. This is this is kind of weird for me. And and Bayon, I think, has like a white science trench coat and goggles on. <laughs> like he's just like a scientist walking around. Yeah. Kind of weird. But that is a really good point that I that I it didn't really sink in with this of like I mean, I've thought a lot about crossovers and magic system crossovers. Right, you know, having uh, breaths on Roshar and things like that, but but like the technology, I don't know what to make about that. How does that affect like the? I don't know. I don't want to say the integrity of the story because it's not going to affect that. But like, feels pretty major. I imagine this is just going to be more isolated of like nods at things of these characters and gives the reader clues to pick up on these characters and such and where they're from or whatnot as they read whether or not they have read all the Cosmere I imagine it's just for that purpose but I'm like having all these things all these devices and tech futuristic technology on Roshar isn't that a big deal isn't that gonna like you know if 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 Moash shows up with a a shotgun I mean like <laughs> isn't that <laughs> Is that cause for concern? It's not going to happen, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I yeah. used to worry about this, Paul, but <laughs> having, having read the books that you have not, he actually walks a good line between characters who are being exposed to like new technology for the first time and then not sacrificing the, the narrative. I, I used to be afraid of that as well, but I think by the time Stormlight 5 actually arrives, you won't have that worry. I, I'm glad you said that. I was gonna say. I mean, my my worries are for not. That, that's not. I'm not worried about uh, any of that actually happening. But you know, in the hypothetical game, this could get really crazy really quick. So, anyways, yeah. I mean the 
the advancement of tech on Rosha has always like scared me a little, just because I just love the vibe of how Rosha is now, and like to think of like Kaladin driving in his car with his shard gun. I'm just a bit like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Wait, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if he'll go that far, but I think he's going to take it. Like, it seems like that's what he's doing with the Cosmere. And I feel like six through 10 is going to be quite different level. Cause like, I mean, who would have thought bridge four was going to be like a flying craft in a few books. No one would have thought that. I, so, yeah. I also had the same reaction to the fourth bridge when it showed up in Rhythm of War pre-release chapters. I was like, no, don't give me an aircraft <laughs> descending on Hearthstone. That's dumb. But actually, I was I was fine with it after I read it in the yeah. actual book. Yeah, I think we just got to get used to it. Um, the only closing thing I wanted to say for this chapter is just because <laughs> cause I'm not letting go of Axe and Dweth, we have a bit more info on her as uh i just looked at what i'd highlighted in the chapter apparently this person with the rings had also she's a skilled healer and her room smelled of fish from the pure lake so maybe we need to reread the pure lake chapter to see yeah if, like, is that someone Ishik's else's wife yeah to be was she a there healer? is like the the I don't remember who she is. In my head, a motherly character, because I read this not too long ago. That's like, kind of helps sort of take care of Ishik, and it's implied she's almost like the, I don't know, the village nurse or something, where it's like, here, just have some of this soup, and you'll feel better, you know, kind of thing. So do you think it's her, maybe? Maybe we just didn't see how many rings she was wearing in the first chapter, because it feels like a good link. It could be... I. I don't recall any form of description. I mean, there's probably a basic description. I definitely don't recall any notice of rings. I feel like that would have really stood out to me hmm. on a reread. So I'm not sure. Because then in my idea, like, Hoyd had Ishik on his payroll. So, like, why wouldn't he have the, the cook as well? That could maybe be a candidate for who that was. Maybe. I think it's a good line of thought for sure. I think I jumped to a different assumption from the same information, which was just mm. like maybe X and it, uh, maybe assume this is X and with, and she knows something about the pure lake fish that we don't more of, mm. Oh, she's connected the fact that the pure lake fish are magic. So she carries a bunch of dried magic fish around with her to do something, whatever that is. But I, I think the line of logic of, Oh, oh man, we're crossing all the the lines now. <laughs> Fair Kenley and AVR and Magic Fish and guns and perpendicularities. This is a crazy chapter. All right, this chapter set aside. Let's zoom out and talk about Stormlight Five as a whole. I'm going to do some quick rapid fire questions. If we need to stop on any of these questions and discuss them, I will allow it. But I'm going to give us 60 seconds. So if you have an argument to make for the stance you take, be brief and be quick because we have several of these to go through. So some of the most general Stormlight 5 predictions I could find or I could think of. Here we go. I will answer first and we'll kind of go around the circle. Quick fire. Yes or no. In Stormlight 5, and these questions need to... These predictions are specifically for, as we assume it will be called, wind and truth. So this this has to happen in book five, not at some point in the future of Stormlight or off screen between Stormlight 5 and Stormlight 6. Or I wonder if off screen in Stormlight 5, I wonder if that counts. But we'll, we'll tally this up later and reconvene you know, sometime next year and see who won. <laughs> Okay. Stormlight 5 predictions. Will we see Kaladin's fifth ideal? I said yes. Elliot? Definitely yes. Christian? I'm already forgetting what I wrote, but I think yes. Paul? I'm not in the camp of definitely, but I am in the camp of yes. Okay. 
will Kaladin die in Stormlight 5? I said no. I also said no, but was quite surprised to see so many no's. Yeah, I don't... I don't die is an interesting word. Maybe he'll change, but he won't die. That's what ah, I'm going with yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe as we know him, he will die, but like he'll still be alive. Paul? And I, I, I think he won't die. I went back and forth on this a lot, actually. I think we've had the quote honorable. Kaladin has been our overarching main protagonist, I would argue, through a lot of, from page one. And I think he's going to stick it out. I don't think we're going to have a Ven 2.0. So that, that was my main argument, was I feel like that would be too similar to Vin. Anyways. Okay, we'll come back to Kaladin in a second. Will we see Shalon's fifth ideal? I said no. No. Mm, no. <laughs> no way. So my, my, I, I changed this at the very last second. My gut says no. The title says wind and truth. Oh, yes, okay. I changed it to oh, really? yes. I think we will get it. I don't. I still don't fully understand how the Lightweaver ideals work. It's a bit weird, and she's a bit washy at, at the current mm. moment. Shalon is, but I think we'll see. I'll, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say we'll see it. I'll add super quick. I feel like we saw so much development of Shalon in Rhythm of War. Actually, she she didn't get as much screen time maybe as other characters, but we made massive strides with her char characters characters and, and so I, I feel like to then turn around and give her like another huge stride in book five would be a little weird i think we're going to see other characters make bigger bigger steps so Shalon's Shal a little point. bit done yeah. i was going to ask i don't think we've seen a fifth ideal anywhere ever have we we don't even know what it is what happened Did we? yeah there's like mentions that the heralds were of the fifth ideal but we don't know what those ideals were i don't think right okay did we see a Shalon ideal in Rhythm of War? She, you're right. She got a lot of development. I don't think we saw an ideal. ideal. Unless it was with the... Was, was her admitting the, in, about her old spread an ideal for pattern? That'd be weird. I don't remember. Isn't early Kaladin and Yasna a fourth ideal that we know of? Yes, so I feel like Shalon getting two ideals in one book. Just yeah, like, yeah, that, that is happened. fair. Yeah, I guess I thought she was at that same same stage by the end of it. Yeah. So. Although, depending on how <clears throat> this is a tangent and not sixty seconds. However, <laughs> depending on how you read Oathbringer, she actually is in her like shard plate. You, depending on how you read it, she is actually radiant in shard plate on the battle of Thalen Field, and not Shalon, who's like a scholar. On the, that, that is a whole can of worms that I don't mm -hmm. know if I've ever brought up on the podcast. But she, Adolin, like goes up to Shalon after the battle and starts talking to her, and Shalon disappears, and she's actually radiant, who's in shard plate over here. Um. We we can. Are you are you posing that like different personalities can be at different levels? Oh yes, ideal? with different oh. with different. Yeah, trends. yeah. Exactly. Well, Shalon might not get to the fifth ideal, but Radiant. <laughs> but Radiant <laughs> might. <We'll see. laughs> yeah, we'll see. Nice. Yeah. I like it. All right. Will Shalon die? I said no. Mm, no. Nope. I also said no. All right. Will we see Dalinar's fifth ideal? I said yes. Who? This one I struck. Kaladin is an absolute yes for me. Kaladin fifth ideal just feels right. Dalinar fifth ideal. Ugh, I struggle with this one, but I think I'm going yes. I don't. I, I'm the lone one in this, aren't I? I'm the only no in this camp. I don't know. I just feel like once you hit the fifth ideal, I, is there a sixth ideal? Like, does that even or is fifth the top? Is that just my head cannon? No, as far as we know, five is top, I think. Yeah, as far yeah. as we know, five is as high as is possible. Yeah, so I'm going to say no. Okay. I'm, as we've talked through this, and as you'll mention stuff about Shalon, it makes me question this. 
I feel like it's like there's not going to be time for all of our like favorite characters to get their fifth ideal, you know? So I, I don't know. I feel like if, if Shalon doesn't, which seems unlikely, the more I think and talk about it, then I also don't think Dalinar would. I think Dalinar is going to have his own development, but I don't know if it's going to be a fifth ideal. If someone were to go through that crazy transformation towards a fifth ideal, I would definitely vote Dalinar over Shalon. But anyways. Okay. Will Dalinar die? This is a tough one. I said yes. This is a really tough one because as we've talked recently, Sanderson characters don't often die. <laughs> or as we've talked on a, a recent episode, sometimes the, the definition of death is not what you think it is. So it's almost like it's a bit of a loaded question in some aspects. All that said, I think if there's a character that is, that is going to die in this book, I think it might be Dalinar. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you, Elliot. Um, whether he stays dead or not, it's another question. I right. want a big, yeah, I want a big Dalinar death, and I want evil Dalinar trudging through the Cosmere. That's what I want. Oh, boy. Ooh. And uh, it's going to happen. So I voted yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, mine, mine, I actually voted no. And mine, it, it is with the stipulation, I guess, of what does, what does, what are we classifying as dying? I'm assume, assuming that is like Dallin or the, the person in the physical realm here dying. It's funny that we have to be super specific about what we mean by dying whenever you look at this. But at least Dalinar, as we know him, I think I think there may be some crazy Cosmere level stuff that he's put up to if he loses the contest of champions and things. But I think Dalinar is the character we know him will still will still exist. Whether or not we'll, he's physically there or not, I guess we'll see. But moving into a new style of question, will Dalinar be his own champion, be honors champion in the contest? I voted yes. Too simple. Gotta be no. I think I did vote no for, for this, but I'm I'm thinking of that artwork of him trudging up the stairs, which mm -hmm. makes me want to say yes. Christian, I also thought of that same artwork. Yeah. But that artwork is the reason, not the only reason, but a main reason why I put no. Oh. Because I think it's a little bit of a misdirection. I think it's a little bit of you what what Trevor said. I'm I'm gonna talk for one second here. You know, the the whole emphasis that Dalinar has as a character is, you know, don't 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 make someone do something that you wouldn't do. So Dalinar needs to do it so that, you know, he's willing to do it. However, I don't know how it's going to be written exactly, but I think there's going to be some stipulation, some reason, reasoning, some whatever for Dalinar to have, have an actual champion, which this is a new, new shift for me. I think I've always been in the camp that Dalinar would be his old own champion. But I think I think we're going to be surprised. I don't know what in what way, but I think there's going to be a surprise with that. So I said no, he will not be his own champion. As I was filling this out, I had a little thought to myself. We just finished Secret History, and there's very much circular closure to Kelsier and Vin's story, where Vin or Kelsier says, you need to learn a lot about friendship or, or some, there's a line about friendship of, of Kelsier's last line to Vin. And then Vin's last line to Kelsier is you have a lot to learn about love. So I had the thought of what if Kaladin shows up like late, maybe to the contest of champions and down and tells Dalinar, what is, what is a man's life life worth? <laughs> and then takes his spot in the contest or, or something to that effect, where he he then trades his life for Dalinar's shard blade back in uh, the That'd way of be kings. Brilliant. Yeah, honor is dead, but I'll see what I can do. Two point oh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'll, honor is dead, but I'll see what I can do. 
to revive him and then pull him back. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> there you go. That's the one. That's the one. I was uh, like, part of me just thinks the more we talk about it, the more I think Sando is going to be like, he's going to twist the whole contest. And within 10 chapters, we're like, oh my God, this was nothing like we even thought, or maybe it doesn't even happen, or it's just completely different. Yep. And all this theorizing was for uh-huh. naught. I am kind of in that camp. I've loved. I, I I think my favorite discussions we've had are theorizing how the contest of champions will be. All of our theorizing has been on will he win? What's the gimmick? Like who is Odium going to put up? Todium going to put up that down or refuses to fight or can't beat or whoever, you know. And I'm I'm now starting to get into this camp of. Isn't it like? pretty apparent if you, if you have everyone thinking about this everyone hyping up this one scene to totally and not be what they expect because they've been theorizing for so long what it's going to be like so i'm kind of in the camp it's going to be some twist that we really didn't see coming so uh, everyone's asking who's honors champion who's odium's champion no no who's cultivation's champion that's who <laughs> we should really be talking about lift yeah yeah ah. <laughs> Steal some pancakes during the contest. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. Will Dalinar's champion or honors champion win the contest? I said yes. No, I think it's. I think not. I think the contest, if it does happen, is going to go poorly, and it's going to kick off the like major dilemma our heroes have to face in this book it's going to be catastrophe and that's going to be like this the sander lanch of of this book is how do we solve apocalypse i completely agree with that completely i i also completely agree i it's odd that i don't see a an excellent trajectory for the story without Dalinar losing, which makes me very sad. <laughs> but I think he will lose. He's got to go. He's got to yeah. go. Like his whole arc, it just feels like his arc is somewhat complete. So he's either dead or he's evil Blackthorn. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make Elliot, <laughs> Elliot sad over there. I don't know if Elliot's I might ready cry. to hear that. I might cry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What part of the book will the contest happen in? I'm going to go out on a limb and say the end of part two. I think this is early half of the book, part two. Yeah, I think about the same for the reasons I I just said. I think the contest is going to set up our big challenge for the heroes. Well, it is a long book. Part of me wants to say part one, but part two may as well be part one in like a storytelling sense, like first third of the book. I'll put it that way. First third of the book. I, I agree. I think it has to be a part one or part two. Seeing, honestly, only based off of the first couple like flashback chapters that we've kind of seen in, of book five, like early release stuff for Zeth, makes me think it's not alongside these major events. So that makes me think it's part two or maybe part three and part four and five are just like crazy Cosmere stuff going on i could see that happening and that being way more sander lynch time frame but then it's hard for me to see two and a half to three parts of not this yeah so mm-hmm. I, I would guess part two as well i would guess part two logically all righty here's an interesting one will moash die or perhaps more correctly will vire die you could argue that moash is already dead will vire die I said yes. Nope. No, there's more to do, I think. There's a little bit more to do with him. So, no. I do think that there is more to do, but I do think he will die. Nice. I So, uh, Elliot and Christian, are you guys predicting that Kaladin and Moash conflict is pushed into like the back half? Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. Wow. I I think not for reasons we're going to talk about a few questions from now. Okay. Cool. Will Zeth die? I said yes. 
I think everybody's going to die, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> after filling this out. Uh, yes, I think Zeth will die. I think Zeth might die. I'm I'm on the page of, I think Sanderson does not kill very many characters. He He does that very carefully and selectively, so I'm not going for a all the characters die at the end of the at the end of the book, but I think Zeth might be in the yes category. I that feels like the kind of closure he needs as a character. I, I don't know that a Zeth Harsh. that I I mean it is, but like the guy the guy is li- the guy's living like a walking nightmare. He he's carrying so much guilt, he's carrying so much weight, so much evil destruction that he's done. I don't know how a character reconciles that. I don't know how a character can live a happily ever after after the life he's lived. I, I this is gonna sound harsh too, but I think happily after after happily ever after for Zeth is death. <laughs> that's a good uh, quote. That's woo! a great quote. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just make him the champion then at that point. Just throw him in the ring. Ooh. Yeah, honestly. Against Teravangian, he, he would totally go for that. Oh, that'd be awesome. Uh, look, the thing is, I said no because just because I think it's because I'm not satisfied yet with Zeth's story. But if any book will do it, it's this book. Um, it'd be an interesting move to make like a flashback book where the character dies. It'd be a big emotional punch. But I, I hesitate to say yes, so I'm being cautious with a no. For that one, I I agree with Christian. This is the this is quote like this is Zeth's book. This is his flashbacks, his story, and so the questions that you have, Elliot, of how can Zeth move forward? How can he live a life again after all the things that he's done and been through and all the stuff? I think that is what we will get to with his storyline in this book. The real answer is, as the youth, as the kids nowadays might say, copium. I'm, I'm coping, <laughs> and I don't want Zeth to die because <laughs> he's been like my favorite character throughout most of the story. So that that also goes into it that I, I like Zeth, but I think I, I unironically think that there is a lot to happen with his character. This this is a bold prediction, which probably won't come into fruition because I don't know that there's been enough backing of it prior to book five. Um, but, okay, no, this is this is a dumb prediction, but I'm going to go and say it anyways. If if Dalinar dies, let's say, let's say several characters die. I'm not going to name anyone else except Dalinar, but a couple of people die, and this is all going, and this is really, you know, the world is in shambles. Zeth has really been through the ethical ringer and all these things, I could see him being a very much not like Sazed, but a Sazed esque, like stepping into a major role because hmm. he has such a unique perspective. But the problem with that is that his he is very like adult, he's very torn apart by all the things that have happened. So it makes it very difficult for him to be to, for me to ever think of him as like a leader character or someone to guide people or, you know, yeah, guide people, lead people. But I mean, there's a lot of development that could happen over this huge book that I think that would be really cool. But I don't think that would happen. I don't think we would end and it's like Dalinar dies and Zeth picks up the mantle to lead the rest of. The, I, I don't mm-hmm. think that would happen. But I would be all for it. That would be my my ending you know i think of it like who would be the coolest to be like the wise old veteran in the Mm. back half and like kaladin best option probably seth's the close second probably after all he's gone through he would be a great older master to a stone walker the best option is clearly teft but that ship sailed. In the last <laughs> <That's because book. laughs> oh, he's already the wise guy. He's, he's yeah. He was he was the older, you know, role role model, I guess, esque character. Not role model, but you know, master. Theft. I don't know, experienced character in this series. Yeah. Rest in peace. I love Teft. Um, 
this next one, I'm surprised by the answers here. Will Adolin die? I said yes. No. Again, it just feels too early. I don't know why it just yeah. feels too early. Trevor because really like, does have everyone dying. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Everyone's yeah. dead. Except well, like, for Shalon. And which all <laughs> yeah. but Paul, go ahead and answer. <laughs> and then I, I'll, um, I'll I, explain myself. Yeah. I don't think I don't think Adolin will die. I don't have any major footing for this, just hunch. I don't I don't think he'll die. I think this is gonna be a much happier ending as at least with our characters living in that term than Mistborn was. We're coming off of the back of Mistborn Era 1 where it was just carnage, so, you know. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. <laughs> Everybody's dead except for Shallan. And at the end of the book, well, towards the end of the book, or maybe, ooh, maybe right before the Contest of Champions, Shallan finds out that she's pregnant. Adolin is the champion dies as the champion and that is how adolin dies so i do think adolin will die i don't actually think he'll be the champion i i think dalinar will be his own champion but i do think sean will be pregnant and then adolin will die shortly after that um that is my mm -hmm. prediction just, there interesting because my whole very tragic yeah very tragic my whole line of thinking was sanderson's so gonna do shallan and adolin kids it's just like in my head, that's definitely happening, but that works for your theory. So maybe, so maybe yeah, he can. She's gonna have it. she's gonna have triplets, and yeah. Adolin's gonna die. <laughs> nice. She's gonna name them what? Adolin Junior, Kaladin, <laughs> and I don't know, Maya or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel like Maya has and Adolin have some work to do. They do. Mm -hmm. That oh, is yeah. true. They do. Yeah. Will Maya resurrect as a full sprint? Maybe it's a life I, triangle. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said yes. Maya will resurrect as a full friend. Oh, I yeah, will be very good. disappointed if she doesn't. That that was so leaned into pretty hard in Rhythm of War. If if that if that plot thread doesn't go somewhere, I'll be I'll be mad. Yeah, I'm going to change my answer to yes. She should. I think it would be better for the story if she did. I also uh, kind of originally had my answer as a no, but you're right. This is absolutely where that is heading with book four. The reason that I put no on a gut instinct is because, I mean, we did kind of get that shown in Rhythm of War where she speaks, and that's a huge deal. That's, that's an enormous deal. But, I mean, aside from that, it's... I don't know. It's hard for me to wrap my head around the dead spren reviving, becoming alive again, becoming full spren. We, I just need to see that fleshed out more, which this is probably how we'll see it is through Maya. And maybe that'll give people hope for honor. I, I have no idea, but yeah, I would probably swap over to yes on, on this. And our last death question, I think will Teravangian die? I said yes. <laughs> Just add another corpse to the pile. <laughs> Not in the contest of champions, but by the end of the book, yes. Oh, interesting. Um, I said no because I think he's going to be the big bad of the overarching Cosmia story. So do I'm you, a bit we... conflicted on this. I said no, but I don't have any major grounds for it. I'll just pass the mic back over. Trevor was saying something. Do you think Teravangian Odium will leave Roshar then, Christian? Yeah, yeah, eventually. Eventually. I think he's going to go mad with... Because when you... Oh, like, as... Well, oh, don't know if... I don't want to get into spoiler territory, but just in the idea of shards, the shard, the idea of the shard takes mm -hmm. over the host to some degree. And mix Taravangian with <laughs> Odium. It's a bad, it's a bad day. And I don't know if his um whole situation from cultivation slash the Night Watcher lives on his intelligence. I just feel like it's too much of an interesting thing to to stop yet. That that one was specifically raffled by Mr. Sanderson. Oh, really? Someone, yeah, somebody asked him. Uh, 
does Teravangian still have good days and bad days yeah. as Odium? And he said Rafo. So that's an interesting one. I, I was talking to add to this. I was talking with um, another friend of mine about Cosmere stuff one time, and he is very much in the camp that everything going on is all a part of Cultivation's plan. That the specific touches and that Cultivation will ultimately be the big power going on here. Like, overall, on Roshar. I mentioned that briefly in a video I did, um, where it seems like we've seen so much about Odium, especially and Honor, but Cultivation's very much in the background. And it feels like Lyft, Taravangian, and Dalinar are her, are her little long plays. So... Yeah, it just feels like there's more to be done. This this is going out on a limb, but another reason why I think Teravangian may not die is I think there's going to be some crazy stuff, that, the, specifically the interaction between Teravangian and Dalinar within the whole contest of champions and the aftermath of that is by far what I'm most invested in and can't wait to see in book five. Hands down, like not even a close second, I think at this point, like way up there. And Teravangian plus Odium is a horrible uh, duo. I agree. I'm holding out hope that somehow Teravangian won't be the big bad, which seems crazy. Not necessarily because I'm like, oh, I like Teravangian, but I think there's going to be a twist to this, whether that's through Cultivation, whether that's through Dalinar, some way, shape, or form, I think there's going to be some, some twist. But that's probably underestimating Odium. In general, anyways. <laughs> Nightblood takes up odium. Heard it here first. <laughs> you already tried that. Yeah. All right. Will someone be the full vessel, reform, and ascend to honor? I said no. This is the biggest question for me for book five. Will we see? I, I'm a little biased, right? Because we just came out of Mistborn Era One, so I've just witnessed a pretty epic somebody stepping up and taking on not one but two shards. So the the biggest question at the forefront of my mind is: It possible to like reform honor, bring honor back, and ascend to vessel of honor? I think yes, just because it would be so epic. I think that is the climax of book five. I want that to be the case, but I just don't feel like he's going to do it, sadly, as much as I want it to happen. Or if he's going to do it, maybe not in the next book. I could see, like, I kind of just see this book ending on a big, like, oh, crap moment. And we're like, what does the rest of the series even look like? So I could see maybe like a fake out Kaladin death. And then maybe the honor stuff happens. Like honor shows up in six to 10. We're like, Ooh, is that, is that Kaladin? Maybe, you know, that could be a, a thing. So I'm going to say no for now. I said yes with a stipulation of, to my knowledge, I will leave it at that. To my knowledge, there is no reforming a shard. I could be wrong. I don't. I don't. I still have not read everything in the Cosmere, but to my knowledge, that is not possible. We are seeing for the first time potentially a Spren coming back from being dead. I think with Maya, mm -hmm. and yeah. I will say as we wrap up Era One of Stormlight, with a lot. I mean. I guess my only other era wrap-up experience is with Mistborn, but there were incredibly major Cosmere implications that we learned as that series ended. And I think we will probably learn new things as this series ends, so we may learn that it is possible to re reform a shard or resurrect a shard, if you will. It would just be brand new information. Like, off the knowledge I have right now, I would say no. It's not mm -hmm. possible. However, if it is going to be possible this is when we're going to find that out is what I feel like. So ultimately, yes, I'll say yes. So I do think this is in the future for Roshar. 
I don't think it's in this book. I think the end of Rhythm of War is going to have a big stake in Stormlight 5. Honor is not dead so long as he lives in the hearts of men. I think I think honor will be used in a very powerful way, but I don't think reassembling the shard is the right mm. term there. I th- I think there will be a lot of honor's power used, but it will be done by a mere human, not by a vessel. Cool. Will Roshar survive? I said yes. Roshar is the only living thing be- left on the, on, the world, <laughs> on the world. Everybody else is dead. <laughs> Roshar will survive. I think no, not as we know it. I think we are going to fail the contest of champions. I guess it's going to kick off literal apocalypse and the the planet is going to take a hit. Yeah, I agree. Because it says as we know it, and I think it won't be as we know it. My big theory is um, this thing we keep hearing about in the Honor Visions, the Night of Sorrows, which is yet to happen. My my idea is that the Night of Sorrows shall come at the end of Book Five, mm. and the reason I the reason I a big reason why I speculate that is because one we've got the Ghost Bloods trying to get Stormlight off of Rosha, two we've got this mass exodus, three Lift is a main character in the back half, and she uses Lifelight instead of Stormlight, which I would think would make her extremely important in a world where Stormlight is scarce. Um, so I think Roshar is kind of screwed um, at the end of this book. Yeah. I would agree. I don't think it'll be it as we know it. I think if Roshar survives, it will be a big transformation. You know, I keep referencing Mistborn, but Mistborn Era 1, the world is all gloomy, and then at the end there's flowers and life. This may be the opposite. We may go down in Roshar air quality and and and, and how pretty it is you know i, I think it's going to get real beat up um i okay, would like this ash falling from the sky maybe so who knows <laughs> that's that's the closing um, line of stormlight era one yeah, you know, ash 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 from, the sky. from the sky yeah 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 that, exactly. would, be, that would be funny so um, problematic <laughs> i also just have to say I'm, I'm looking at our outline right now and i'm just i'm really praying every day that trevor's <laughs> predictions don't come true because everyone dies <laughs> but roshar's still happy like it's still a good place to go visit like it's okay unfazed so, but everyone is dead so here th- this actually leans into roshar will not be okay but a question i asked mr sanderson two two three years ago now is and i got a raffo out of it is when teravangian and ray's and raise Odium at the end of Oathbringer, they make a pact. And Teravangian has Odium promise to spare Carbranth. And Carbranth needs to be spared along with all first generation people born in Carbranth. So when I asked Brandon Sanderson, is that still valid? by the end of Rhythm of War, does Teravangian have a pact with himself? <laughs> yeah. And what does that mean? And I got a nice raffle for that one. So that would seem to imply that the only thing left on Roshar may be Carbranth by the end of this book here. So we'll, we'll see. Do you think Sanderson actually knows? Because like he does raffle things. It's a, it's a way cooler thing to say than, oh, I didn't think of that. Uh, but, you yeah. know, there's I, no way he's got everything lined up as much as I with, love Samson. Yeah, I agree. With the creativity that everyone has with digging into these theories, and absolutely, there's no way they thought of all of these things. So, yeah, I think Raph was a great way to tie that up. I'm sure a lot of the stuff is like, yeah, yeah, you'll read and find out. But some stuff like that, he's like, okay. Making a note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, read and find out on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can read imagine Trevor. He had the map ready for Stormlight Six, and everything was destroyed. And after you said that, he's like drawing Carbranth back on it. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Important detail. Yeah. 
we, I could say it. There's something there's something we brought up on the podcast back when we covered the end of Oathbringer. Somebody that we identified as from Carbronth, specifically first generation Carbronth, is along with their spouses, is in the is in the pact. And Kaladin's parents, Kaladin's mom is from Carbronth, oh. Hasina. And uh along with their spouses is in the contract. So I thought that was a very odd inclusion. Mm. So that would include Liren. And the, to see Liren and Hasina come further forward in Rhythm of War um, as point of view characters, I thought was interesting. I think they're going to be very important, especially Liren. I've read a lot of weird things about Liren recently. One said like he'd inadvertently said like many of the oaths of different radiants. If you look in the text, which is very weird to me, but I haven't really gone down the rabbit hole yet. That is weird. I've never yeah. heard that one. Yeah, some someone compiled them. He said like a bunch, and when you think of how much he sticks to his word, he's very radianty. Um, but and isn't oh, isn't Kaladin son of Tanavast? Yeah, I went down that. I went down that way. But Sanderson really refutes like the lineage. Yeah, he does. You're yes. right. But I still think it's a little odd because he also raffled if Tien would also be considered considered the son of Tanavast, which I thought was kind of juicy. Yeah. So maybe Liren's um Liren is honor. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> he could become the if if he if honor comes back, maybe he'll be the vessel you know can you imagine That'd that i think that would be a scary be wild honor. yeah all right a couple more and then we'll round out the episode here will all four dawn shards be assembled and used against odium by the end of the book <laughs> i said uh no <laughs> Did, despite reading an entire novel titled dawn shard I still feel like I don't really know what the heck those things are. And it seems like they should be so important and pivotal in this entire story. And yet they come up so rarely, like really rarely. So mm. it, I think it would kind of feel like pulling the rabbit out of the hat a little bit too convenient. If, Oh, all of a sudden we have four Dawn shards and that's the solution to our problem. So I, I think that's a back half thing on shards i agree although we have I th in my head we have three out of four ready to go in my Which mind are? it's risen um then okay hoyd had one i don't know if he still has it does he still have it do you can you get rid of it i don't know in my mind hoyd okay and then the third one potentially axes because axes okay. like dawn shards give you like weird afflictions right and like hoyd can't hurt people and he can't eat meat these are his like stipulations and axes mentions a similar thing like he has a bad luck one it's called i forgot what it's called but it seems like when you hold one you get a downside so that's do you my think wild. that's tied to capital f fortune at all yes i do i do believe yes capital f fortune okay um, that could be yeah. interesting yeah uh, my my prediction is yes it is fully <laughs> just a wishful optimistic that's i just want them all to come out of the woodworks and just <laughs> in all in all honesty I don't I don't think we'll see it. I think that's kind of the like, you know, how the dark sphere was at the prologue and we just figured out about it more recently. Mm -hmm. I think that's maybe more akin to what we have. We have mentions of Dawn Shards. We kinda know what a Dawn Shard is. We kinda know Risen is a Dawn Shard. But we're kind of I imagine that we're gonna pick that up in the back half or something like that. Do you guys have thoughts on who who else mm -hmm. could hold one? I've I've theorized Shalon for a while, but I think that was that was debunked. I don't remember exactly where I left off with that. But there I, was like the glowing book or whatever before, but I think maybe that was her sprint. I don't remember. But she had a 
shard blade at that point. I think that was something I pointed out. But anyways, Shalon was was one that I had thought about for a while. Shalon is an interesting. I'll just butt it on that super quick because Shalon has an interesting ability that it seems like nobody else has with her memory, capital M memory, yeah. which is you know something that maybe could could play into that. Not not necessarily like a like a curse, or maybe it is. Mm. But maybe it's when you're like, when your mom's a herald. Ooh, like, yeah. and then there's that. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's that. <laughs> yeah. You you just pushed a whole video on that didn't you christian yeah yeah i did well i did it's all it's about all the weird devar family bunch of weirdos um <laughs> not their fault but very very interesting what's going on there yeah i mean i'm i'm like convinced chanarach is her her mum. i actually i think it would actually be a disservice if it's not at this yeah. point it's so yeah. good yeah I keep to answer your Don Shard question. I keep mm -hmm. swaying back and forth on what Dalinar has. Dalinar has something that gives him a warm light in his copy of either Oathbringer or the Way of Kings, or maybe it maybe it passes back and forth. Maybe he puts it into his copy of Oathbringer, but he has his copy of the Way of Kings at the end of our book, Oathbringer. Hmm. It is destroyed by Odium, but he then realizes he doesn't need it. And by the end of the book, he is then writing Oathbringer, the book, it, it, the in-world book. And Navani comes up to the room and like asks if he needs to open the curtains or whatever to, so he can see what he's writing. And he's like, no, it'll distract me from the other light that is inside me or something like that. I don't know. Oh. Um, I keep thinking that Dalinar has the Dawn Shard unity. Um, oh, okay. That's cool. And it's been talking to him since Gavilar started getting all wishy-washy and it, it abandons Gavilar and goes to Dalinar towards the beginning of the way of Kings when he hears unite them. Um, and Gavilar has been dead oh. for a little while now. He keeps hearing unite them for some reason. Anyway, that's interesting. The, the thing I have noticed recently on the reread is that um, honor doesn't show up at the end of the visions with Noah Don, but he shows mm. up at the end of every other vision. So the Noah Don stuff feels different. Um, so yeah, that's maybe helps your theory a bit. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe the most important words a man can say are Don Shard or something <laughs> at the end of the book. Yeah. You, you completely missed it there, Paul. It's obviously following Noah Don is the most Yeah, important. that's <laughs> true. That's true. He'll give us a little nod, Easter egg. I'm pretty sure the Kremlings have the fourth Dawn Shard. That's just my wild card um, theory because of Amia. And yeah. uh, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. Do you think they had two and gave one to Rissen? Um, I'm not too sure. It, that would be a bit weird, I think. It'd be a missed opportunity to keep the mystery of the Dawn Shards going if you had two in one place. So maybe right. they just uh, passed it on. Although my right. of that novel is very hazy. Will we learn what shattered the planes? I'm surprised <laughs> on these answers, too. I said no. I think tying into... I think honor is going to get reformed and a vessel is going to appear for honor. Probably Kaladin, but maybe somebody else and tied in with that. I think we're just going to learn a little bit more about honors background in general. And I think part of that is going to be the shattering of the planes. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I, I said yes, but I don't know how maybe that's how that would be cool. I do think it has part of me thinks it's like a big a result of some sort of battle that honor had um, thousands of years ago. That could be cool. So, yeah. I, I also think we're going to learn about it. I don't know exactly how, if I were to throw a wild prediction out there, I would say it's something that we learn while we're in Shinobar. Oh, some kind okay. of old legend, old text or something 
sage old wise man pops out of the bushes and says, <laughs> have you heard about it? <laughs> About Did you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're yeah. <laughs> they're all about like taboo with moving rocks, and if there's anything that moves oh, rocks, it would be the shattered yeah, planes. That's so. true. And look, I love this series, guys, but isn't it time to move on from these planes? Like, I've had <laughs> enough. Like, I want to yeah, see the rest of Yeah, it's such a massive planet. Like, tell me how it happened. I've had a good time there. Let's go somewhere else for the yeah. next box. It's such a cool mental visual, though. He he hit a home run with the Shattered Planes, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're amazing. They're amazing. But it's just, yeah. like, look, they're a dot on the map of Rosha, really. They're tiny. All right. One more question. Perhaps the most hotly contested in the <laughs> fan circles. Moash. Will Moash ask for forgiveness or redemption before the end of the book. I said yes. Like it or not, some people are going to love it. Some people are going to absolutely hate it. I think we're getting a Moash redemption arc. I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be emotional in a lot of different ways. Hmm. The only reason I said no is because I thought it was not in this book. I think it is coming. Mm. But... I could see, like, I could definitely see it happening. This book because he needs to tie up some things, right, from this first arc, and maybe the Moash Kaladin thing does get tied up, or maybe Moash and Kaladin keep getting more powerful, and it just becomes a bigger and bigger antithesis to Kaladin as a character. So it's coming, I agree, but maybe not this book. That's where I'm at. Okay, one thing I hadn't thought about, which I want to point on really quick what you mentioned christian what if like you know as time goes on somehow through a lot of different things kaladin ascends to honor and moash ascends to odium that would be pretty nuts going into a, a future series of books with that kind of thing um i i want to i want to specify this question asks will moash ask for forgive re- forgiveness slash mm. redemption arc yeah. I think no. I think I think no. I think Moesh is going to remain evil. If you are asking the question, do I want a Moesh redemption arc? I would probably say yes. I actually I am actually on that camp where I kind of want it. But I don't I don't think there is going to be one. So for Christian's sake, I'm going to quickly recap a little theory that I that me and Elliot came up with. As we were going over um, the death rattles, Christian, you mm. front and center the death rattles on your podcast. Let me no longer hurt. Let me no longer weep. Digonarthus, the black fissure, holds my sorrow and consumes it. Based mm. on that, I came with the theory that Odium has assigned Digonarthus to Moash to consume his emotion to where he can't feel anything. And when Navani resurrects the tower and expels Moash out of the tower, he briefly feels pain very Mm. briefly. And then it, and then his, his nothing returns. His lack of emotion returns very quickly after that. So I think Diagonarthus has a personal assignment to Moash and that's how he is, pain is consumed and how he doesn't feel anything so moving into Stormlight 5 I think that is severed somehow and that's how Moash then asks for redemption and can feel the pain that he's caused that's very cool I like that um, I think I think um, Odium would use I don't know if Odium could do it himself but Diagonathus seems like the best candidate if it's not just Odium doing it um, I also speculated in my Devar video that Diagonathus is the unmade messing with the Devars. Okay. Because of Nan Balat pulling on the crumbling legs and like yeah. feeling relief. It's like taking his sorrow. Um, mm. And Sanderson said, like, there's something magical going on with Nan Balat. So I was like, probably in an unmade. And that seemed like the best candidate. 
Um, and it seemed to work on people who were kind of in that spot already where like Moash is like a willing participant. Like, I don't want to feel this. And same with basically every Devar child. They've got so much trauma that they don't want to deal with. So that unmade is like, oh, these guys are great. Let's let's do let's take away their sorrow or consume it or whatever. So yeah. Maybe it's um not just um Moash. I think you're right there. That's cool. All righty. Anything else, gentlemen? Any closing thoughts? Uh, I mean, the book's just going to be insane, basically, is what I'm gathering. <laughs> That's basically yeah. where I'm at. <laughs> Whatever he does, it's going to be great, I think. Great. One, th- one thing I want to point out as we, as we wrap up, uh, some perspective that I, that I hadn't thought of that I think you've, you've been way more in the camp of, Christian, that I want to mention, is the, how much of this is going to be in the back half books and how much will be wrapped up in a bow at the end of book five. I've been in the camp of, I think a lot, like the bulk of our questions, if you will, a lot of the stuff is going to be wrapped up this book, but I'm starting to rethink this a bit. I really don't know. There's so much on the, on the docket that I don't, I don't know if I know how much can, how much will be, but yeah, that, that's the main thing that I that's that I've been thinking of differently, kind of as we've as we've talked about all this. Kind of in that is, vein, I was I, I was going to piggyback on on that thought there, Paul. I think I'm really excited for this book because Brandon talks about this in in multiple different forums and places. The concept of like making an investment with your reader and then cashing out that investment at a future time. He, he plants those seeds early. He, he contributes to those, those funds. And then at at some point he, he makes a big withdrawal. He makes a big cash out where you just get this, Oh my gosh, that's so cool moments. He's so good at that. That's like his, his thing is this foreshadow what's going to happen, feed into it, have so many cross link elements coming together into this one, like blow your mind moment. I think we're going to see that on a level we have not seen before in, in this book five, I think he is going to pull out all the stops and cash in a lot of what he's been investing in throughout stormlight. I think he will save some things for, for the back half for sure, but I bet he's going to go big with, with this one. And I'm, I don't know if we're all emotionally ready for it. <laughs> Christian, are you planning on speed reading it when it comes out or two weeks, a month? What's your plan? It's it's within a week. It's done. I think, I think well, in a week, one week. <laughs> one week. Yeah. Um, that's just the initial read. The sure. thing was like, I was a very, I was in a very different point when I got rhythm of war. I was, very, I was still pretty new. To, to this whole thing but now it's like an insatiable hunger is upon me <laughs> it's <laughs> like i have to read this thing very quickly and then i'll probably go back and uh dissect it from there i just think i want to know what happens um very quickly are you guys going to dragon steel is that the plan yes yes mm-hmm. so what happens then when everyone gets the book like you guys are just going to go back to the hotel and <laughs> peace out some people do for me and elliot it's a long painful road <laughs> yeah <laughs> trevor so, I, I don't remember where we landed but i think trevor is gonna speed read and we're gonna i'm tag along. i'm still conflicted i would love that i would love nothing more to go blind with elliot and paul to to cover it on the podcast however there's two problems with that. Somebody has to format our chapter splits and doing that blind is really hard uh, and impossible Two, if there is any piece of media ever in existence, I would be afraid to get spoiled on. Mm. It would be stormlight five. Mm. I like, there are so many characters I'm so heavily invested in that if somebody casually came up to me, or messaged me on Discord, just assuming I had read it, and been like, "Oh, how, what do you think of that Kaladin death scene?" I've been like, <laughs> "No, yeah, right, right." And I, 
I have very few great fears in life, but that is one of them. <laughs> so I I may speed read like a weekend or a week, or like you said, yeah. just just to preserve myself and experience the book as Brandon intended it, mm. and then and then and then cover it with the with the guys on the podcast. I, so, I'm to be decided. Are you saying Elliot and Paul, you guys are doing a chapter a week? You're not gonna no, oh not one God. chapter, Correct. but about three, three to four wow. chapters a week. It'll take us six yeah, months. We'll going, that is a we'll, we'll like, amazing the book for a while. Yeah. Wow, this is what wow. we've done so far. But this is the first time we'll be like book release, current everything. You know, like we were there when when Rhythm of War released, but we we weren't there yet. Like we were reading like The Way of Kings or Rhythm. Wow. Of, Words we of just started Words of like Radiance. That. Yeah, I can't even fathom. You've broken my brain. <laughs> like, I'll, have, you... <laughs> I'll have the book in my hands and say, "Nope, I can't. Like, have to put it down tonight." You know, chapter six. That's, that's enough. That's enough yeah. for this month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah exactly. Happen? And and that's the worst the, part is the gig. If yeah, I if I read guys. it, if I read it with them, we'd have to set it down mid like contest, mid Sanderlanch, because those chapter splits would be blind. Right? If, yeah, if we true. Did that, we would have to like hire someone. I, I don't know. I think maybe Ranks offered to 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 do that at some point of like yeah. read it and just kind of provide us like this mm. is the chapter splits I would do, and just let us let us do it, which would definitely be the most impartial way for us to do it. But I absolutely understand Trevor's point of dodging spoilers. I've dodged spoilers for like four years now on everything <laughs> so I, it doesn't phase me i'm not gonna I, I feel cool with it at this point but it's more gonna be that the patience oh, of, of getting through it amazing all right you should unsub from my channel <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. like immediately <laughs> I, I know i know that first episode after it comes out you're just gonna be talking all stormlight five and i'll be like i can't listen to this podcast for another six months <laughs> Yeah, the whole wall behind me will be like red tape and pictures yeah. and full <laughs> conspiracy mode. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. We will close it there. Thank you so much, Christian, for joining us on this. It ended up being a rather lengthy episode <laughs> of following Know It On, episode 190. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much, guys, for having me on. It was an absolute blast. And thanks for joining me as always, Paul and Elliot. You got it. Sayonara. <laughs> <laughs>